사람의 어, 그 기본이 어디에 있는지 그거를 보게 해준 거여서 참 그야말로 눈이 뜨는 이 책입니다. 총균철 그 사람에 대한 그 애정이 아주 그냥 뭉클뭉클 느껴지는 그런 책이에요. Uh, went around asking leaders in various fields to name one book that had touched them the most. And for me, the answer was immediate. I didn't even have to think. Um, guns, germs, and steel. And it was so mind-opening and even liberating. And I was even happily surprised to learn from the interviewer that the book, in fact, topped the list of favorite readings among the students that Seoul National University at the time. I've also read Collapse and Upheaval, of course, so I owe you a great deal uh, for the way I think and for the way I look at the world and humanity. So it's definitely an understatement to say that I am very honored and delighted to have this conversation with you, of course, though by video. I would like to begin by expressing my pleasure at having any contact with Korea, even if it is virtual contact. My first visit to Korea was about 22 years ago when I learned about your wonderful writing system, Hangul, which I discovered is the best writing system in the world with no close second. So it was Hangul that got me interested in Korea. Ever since then, I've returned to Korea about five times, always with much pleasure because I really enjoy being with Korean people. So it's a pleasure for me to be with you, even virtually. In light of your lifelong work observing and analyzing humanity's evolution on our planet, what do you think will be the lasting impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on humankind? It has certainly thrown a lot of cold water on our 21st century confidence that we have reached the pinnacle of scientific and technological achievements. COVID is a disease that came to humans from animals. All of the major new diseases of humans in the last half century have come to us from animals. They include AIDS, mad cow disease, SARS, Ebola, Marburg. And so one can say that COVID was just one more in a chain of diseases reaching humans from animals. As long as humans have contact with animals, it is inevitable that we will acquire diseases from animals just as we have in the past. COVID will not be the last disease that we acquire from animals. 네, 다이아몬드 교수님의 책에서 알수 있듯이 총균쇠 이세 가지가 인류의 역사를 변화시키는 가장 중요한 요인이었다고 하는데요. 코로나 뿐만 아니라 정말 인류의 역사에는 늘 균이 반복적으로 등장을 했던 것 같습니다. 코로나는 어떤 의미로 남을까요? Um, will a vaccine be possible? Well, a vaccine has not been possible against AIDS and malaria. It was possible against smallpox. Will it be possible against COVID? We don't know. Will a COVID vaccine protect everyone? We don't know. The best guess is that it may protect half of the people who receive the vaccine. Will COVID mutate or have multiple strains, as does flu, requiring new vaccines every year? Maybe. We don't know. If you receive the vaccine, how long will the protection last? Will it last one year? 
will last three months? We don't know. All of this means then, and adds to your question, the lasting impact of COVID. If one is very optimistic and thinks that COVID will disappear as a risk as soon as we have a vaccine, I would say, no, that is very uncertain. COVID is likely to be a problem for us for the foreseeable future. Hmm. Well, that's certainly a very sobering observation. And I find myself walking closer to the screen unconsciously because <laughs> I want to hear you uh, so uh, closely and carefully and as, as articulately as possible. So I'm back at my place now. <laughs> in germs, in Guns, Germs and Steel, you describe the uh, constructive paranoia of the uh, indigenous habitants of New Guinea. Um, their hyper-vigilant attitudes, I think is the way uh, it was described, uh, towards risks. What led you to that observation? And can you find something related or even similar going on amidst the COVID-19 pandemic? Constructive par paranoia is considered a psychiatric disease. If you are paranoid, if you have exaggerated fears, you should be treated by a psychiatrist. Constructive paranoia is instead an attitude that I learned in New Guinea from New Guineans. In New Guinea, most New Guineans do not have easy access to hospitals or doctors. If something happens, you are in deep trouble in New Guinea. And so New Guineans learn to be very careful. Year after year in New Guinea, when I first went to New Guinea, I had the American attitude, I'm big and tough and I don't have to be afraid of anything. But the accidents happened. I had boat accidents, plane accidents, vehicle accidents, trouble with people, diseases. I learned to be hyper vigilant. That is, I learned to adopt an attitude of constructive paranoia. Constructive paranoia is an attitude that the, that the world needs now. Some countries lead us in showing the way to constructive paranoia. The United States, certainly not. Britain, certainly not. But the Scandinavian country of Finland, Finns have learned to be hypervigilant. Why? Because Finland was attacked by the Soviet Union an enormously larger country in 1939. Finland's trade with the outside world was cut off. And after their war with the Soviet Union, the Finns learned we had better be prepared for anything. And so every month there is a council of the Finnish government which meets to consider everything that could go wrong this council could be considered the Council of Constructive Paranoia. Each month, a friend of mine is on the council. Each month, the Finns think of what could go wrong. Our electricity net could fail. Our telecommunications could fail. Our financial system could fail. We could be invaded. Our trade could be cut off. There could be an epidemic. And so the Finns prepare themselves for everything. Of course, they were prepared for possible diseases. Three years ago, before COVID existed, the Finns had already stockpiled face masks to protect themselves against a possible emerging disease. And so when COVID arrived, the Finns were prepared. Americans were not prepared. Most of the world was not prepared. People of the world should not be overreacting to, to other peoples, should not be prejudiced against other peoples, should instead think of everything that could go wrong and prepare for it, just as did Finland, and just as Vietnam was very well prepared when COVID struck in Vietnam. So there are countries that are well prepared, and there are countries like my country that 
were not well prepared. Um, xenophobia, discrimination play into this because I think you can make the argument that that kind of a defensive mechanism helps with being paranoid, constructively or destructively. So how do you make it constructive and not destructive? Today, with the COVID epidemic, um, hating other people and scorning other people um, is what one could call maladaptive. Um, if one hates other people, under other circumstances, it might not have severe consequences, although you could misjudge other people. But the essence of COVID is that COVID is a global problem. It's not a problem for just one country. Suppose that in Korea, you succeeded in eliminating COVID completely within Korea. Nevertheless, Korea would just get reinfected by COVID in other countries. Just as long as there is COVID anywhere in the world, the whole world will be at risk for COVID. And so we cannot afford to hate other people because other people are potential sources of reinfection by COVID, but we also are potential source of the reinfection of other people. Hatred of other people is a luxury that we can no longer afford. I agree with you completely, but that's a nice um, segue into my next question, which is um, in Upheaval, your most recent book, unless you've written another in the meanwhile, uh, you note that leadership and national consensus is what enables countries to overcome national crisis. And that certainly makes sense in a, the national context, but with COVID-19, as you say, we are faced with a crisis on a global scale. Um, with a global governance uh, system that doesn't have a unified government with the uh, tools and the powers necessary to provide that leadership and build consensus. So, so where and how do we, do we build and find that leadership and consensus? That is a key question about COVID. Leadership is important, of course, at the national level, but also at the international level. COVID is an international problem. Where is the international leadership? We have presidents, we have prime ministers of our countries. We do not have an international leader. It's my hope that COVID will force people of the world to recognize the need a need for international leadership that we have not had in the past. Of course, we have international organizations. We have the United Nations. We have WHO. We have other international organizations. But those organizations do not have leaders as powerful as the leader of the United States or as the leader of Korea. And so a possible benefit, a possible good consequence of the COVID epidemic is that it may force people in the world to recognize that we have to act together and we have to cooperate, which includes developing more effective international leadership, which we have not had until now. You've devoted your lifetime to international affairs and international organizations. And here we have another international crisis. From your perspective, how do you see the current COVID crisis as different, if it is different, from all of those previous international crises with which you have been so skilled at managing them. This crisis has pitted 
a virus, a very fast and silently spreading virus, vis-a-vis -vis humanity. And so the immediate reaction was to close down, shut the borders, lock down, because if you want to stop the virus from spreading, you have to stop people from moving because the virus moves with the people. And so that has made it very difficult to generate that unity of purpose needed to fight this global crisis. Um, so in this situation where that unity of purpose is very difficult to generate, um, how do we do this? How do we do that? Uh, the conversation, global conversation surrounding what is now known as the COVAX facility, led by the WHO and Gabi. I think there are some, something like 160 countries who are now a part of that conversation. Uh, basically, a, a scheme whereby countries pool resources to dig together to help pharmaceutical companies develop, produce uh, the vaccine so that that would be available at mass scale to all countries of the region. I think that conversation is very useful and I think whether this conversation succeeds or not, and, and in the midst of that conversation, I'm sure that the issues that you raise will also come up. Uh, but I think just having that global conversation with everybody joining in, whether this succeeds or not, um, I think it will be a huge test of the, the unity that is needed to overcome this crisis, but also whether humanity is better prepared or not for the next crisis that comes along. And as you say, there will be a next.